Have you ever wondered what this could be? Sure, it looks like a table, but how did it become a table? We have two explanations. Lava flow or rain? When both of these theories fail, what are we left with? If it rained, it would affect the surrounding areas and certainly not leave a stump shape. Lava must have come out in one complete extrusion. And sure, not every stump has to be a tree, but is this tree theory really as crazy as it sounds? Wood can petrify into stone, and some who have looked into this objectively might conclude that these pillars are of basalt, but that still doesn't explain how they're made. Science can't explain everything. Here is an explanation of the theory. The plateaus and mesas of the world are stumps of these great almighty trees of the past. They were cut down by the Nephilim as they served a certain purpose ages ago for our mother earth and humanity. As these trees were cut, the earth became a completely different environment. We shouldn't even call them trees as they could have been something like a large antenna of sorts, a portal to another world. Like we hear in Jack and the Beanstalk, he climbed up into the clouds and entered the land of giants. If you believe in the idea of giants, then the idea of giant trees isn't that far off. Genesis chapter 6 verse 4 says there were giants in the earth in those days. This is something we all have known since children, it's ingrained in our subconscious minds. You'd be surprised how many different cultures share the story of a world tree in the center of the world. A Chaldean inscription describes such a tree as growing at the center of the world. Its branches of crystal form the sky and droop to the sea. The Phoenicians thought the world like a revolving tree, over which was spread a vast tapestry of blue embroidered with stars. This main theme continues on in later ages to come. It would account for a story in Apollonius of Tyana that the people of Sardis doubted if the trees were not created before the earth, and the idea parallel to the controversy in the Talmud. Which came first? Heaven or Earth? One arguing that the object was made first and then the pedestal. The other, that the foundation is laid before the building is erected. All the East knew of such a tree. In Japan, the gods broke their swords against it in vain. In the Norse system, a vast tree, the world ash, rises in the center of the earth, its branches forming the several heavens of God, its roots strike deep into hell. Maori science still represents such a tree as rising to the heavens, that dark nocturnal canopy which like a forest spreads its shade. Its mighty growth first forced asunder heaven and earth. It becomes apparent that this concept is monumental in the development of an early civilization. Rodaima is a giant plateau in Venezuela. There are also many others in this area, but Rodaima is a very famous one. The natives that live here are called the Pemon and Capon. In their culture, they see Mount Rodaima as the stump of a mighty tree that once held all the fruits and tuberous vegetables of the world. Felled by Makonema, their mythical trickster, the tree crashed to the ground, unleashing a terrible flood. Rodoi in Pamon language means blue, green, and Ma means great. They even mentioned that this was just thousands of years ago. Do you know what this means? What if Rodaima is like one of those trees from Avatar? Wouldn't you see the world in a different way? Now, it mentions felled by Makonema, their mythical trickster. Someone made the tree fall, some type of deity. Okay. Let's keep reading. Also, keep in mind that Rodaima is known for its incredibly high frequency of UFO sightings both atop and around the plateau. The Pemon people were the descendants of the mythic hero Makonema. While exploring the primordial world, Makonema came across the Wasaka tree, tree of life, in whose branches grew all types of cultivated and wild plants eaten by the people. Makonema therefore chopped down the trunk, Baai, of the Wasaka tree, which leaned towards the northeast. Hence, all the edible plants found today fell in this direction, especially in the areas covered in the jungle. From the trunk of the Wazaka tree spouted a torrent of water, which caused a great flood during this primordial period. According to the myth, this trunk remained still. This is Mount Rodaima, whence flow the rivers that pass through the traditional territory of these peoples. This also gives insight into the meaning of Angel Falls, which cascades from Rodaima's summit. Mount Rodaima is a sacred place and is a portal into other realms. These myths can tell us about a different side to reality that science can't seem to answer. Experiments and data are a necessity for advancement, but science can't have a 100% answer for everything. This reality can be extremely hard for many to take in because, here's the truth, 
Whether you want to believe it or not, science can't prove what I'm saying to you. If you're operating completely from the left side of your brain, then I can't really move you forward because, you're right, there's little evidence. Just like there's little evidence for how consciousness came to be, or how nothing becomes something. And sure, you can be a theoretical physicist and come up with some gibberish, but ultimately what I'm saying is we don't know. But there are these suppressed collective memories that we all have and that we all can tap into. But even more so, there's a body of oral myths and legends that have been passed on to us. We just refuse to look at it. We know about Hercules, the story of David and Goliath, but here's what we're getting to, the myths on the origin of our species. You know, the whole thing with giants and demigods, aka the angels mating with humans. The creation of our current consciousness is something that modern science is not willing to rationalize. Arguing that there is no way to rationalize it. But I disagree. It just takes more of a creative intelligence. The ability to think abstractly, or in other words, to think symbolically. That is what this reality is. A symbol of 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 a symbol. But anyways, in order to understand all of this, we have to stop rationalizing everything based on our fantasy for space travel. This is how mainstream explains it all. That we're just hybrids of an alien god. This type of thinking still is based on the belief that we came from nothing and that the world has no meaning. Angel means spirit, and spirit means air. So these beings are some type of etheric matter. The whole idea that aliens are demons are a little bit closer to the truth. We also must consider the spiritual concepts when discussing the idea of great trees. Why are all the demons after these trees? What are these trees? Are these trees a part of creation? Do they have a connection with different realms? In Kabbalah, which is also based on the concept of a tree, it is the attempt to categorize God into different sections, different forces, that then gets funneled down into all of existence. Isn't it interesting that each planet, or Nephilim, fallen one, has its own individual rule over a Sephiroth? These trees could be the spiritual forces that dictate a chain of metaphysical and physical realities after its secession. These hidden forces are as to branches in the way they rule. Each of the fallen ones control different aspects to reality, the different gods of many different cultures. So why go over this? Well, in order to believe in giant trees, some type of giant deity must have cut it down, as it says in many legends. This does not work on our current model of evolution, cosmology, or perception of the world. So this is one of the reasons why this idea is getting suppressed. Because it doesn't matter if you believe it, as long as you don't understand that this has something to do with consciousness, God, magic. It really is still a fantasy at the back of your mind, because, I mean, let's face it, if you saw a giant, you wouldn't believe it. Let's look at some other examples. This is the well-known Devil's Tower in Wyoming, USA. Now compared to Rhode Island, you can tell that the erosion is much different than Rhode Island. Different climates, maybe different cataclysms, different energy sources, whatever the case, it looks like a stump. The mainstream definition is that it was formed by igneous intrusion. That molten magma rose from the depth of the earth and stood in the form of elegant columns. It's also said to be the remains of what was once a giant volcano. Maybe that's the case, but these theories are formed because of our unwillingness to explore unconventional theories. We are blind to accepting such simple explanations. This is what we normally see with lava. It dries like this. Where do we see hexagonal patterns? In nature, in spirit. It's such a powerful symbol of harmony and balance. It has deep roots in esoteric philosophy, religion, and our human origins. You find this with bees, and this is because the hexagon has the smallest perimeter among equal area figures. This form is the most effective for construction. Okay, let's take a look at the stem of flax. We see a similar pattern. Flax fiber stems have a hexagonal shape which keeps its shape vertically. Now come on, we can't just keep saying lava is the explanation for all these hexagonal shapes. The theory really starts to fall apart. Well then what's the problem with the tree theory then? Well, you see, most of these pillars are columnar basalt, but the real issue is that science is steeped in uniformitarianism. The world could have been a much different place in the past. We still don't understand how consciousness came to be, so anything goes. And if science will look into the past and stop saying that the alchemists of old were simply misinformed, then maybe they could see the issue at hand. Physical reality is a creation of the subconscious and collective unconscious. 
The world was once more dreamlike, and we have slowly become more physical through the ages. In mainstream history, we can thank Aristotle for creating this type of modern consciousness. This over-analytical, if I can't prove it, it's not real. I understand it's a necessity to a degree in making progress, but as with all things, there must be balance, and we have completely forgotten about this. Many of you are willing to look into these matters, but we have to agree, in general, many would scoff at this material. Take into consideration the myths of a flood from every culture. Let's suggest there was a worldwide flood, and that the minerals that we find in what we call basalt rocks were distributed as particles of soil. The heavy flood waters would have pushed these minerals into any submerged object. Also, consider that the minerals are being compressed by a vast body of water together with underwater volcanoes. This could solidify very quickly. The problem is, science loves to solve problems from within a box, specifically when it comes to our origins. I just think that it becomes insufficient when it comes to consciousness, the history of how our world was formed, and what this reality even is. Science won't even accept giants, even though it becomes clear that there's some type of cover-up going on with the Smithsonian Institute, especially now that they fund the History Channel to literally teach everything but history. Just another cash cow. Anyways, basically what I'm saying is stop trying to get a 100% answer for everything. Most of these people who can't accept these ideas or respond with mocking are atheist or agnostic. So if you're willing to say, I don't know, then can we just meet at, sure, I don't know how these mesas are formed, but hey, I'll keep an open mind. Okay, because now we can learn to use our eyes and let our mind attract the answer. Yes, that is possible, to a degree. Reality can speak to you, and then you can come to your own conclusions. What if in the past reality was like Avatar the movie? There was magic. We lived on the giant trees, till one day the gods became angry. Giant gods came down and destroyed the great trees of the earth, desolating the landscape and leaving it barren. Ages passed and the old pillars that connected the realms had been destroyed. The earth was cut off from spirit. Daniel chapter 4 verse 10 through 15 Thus were the visions of mine head in my bed. I saw and behold a tree in the midst of the earth, and the height thereof was great. The tree grew and was strong, and the height thereof reached into the heaven, and the sight thereof to the end of the, all the earth. The leaves thereof were fair, and the fruit thereof much, and, and it was a meat for all. The beast of the field had shadow under it, and the fowls of the heaven dwelt in the bowels thereof, and all flesh was fed of it. I saw in the visions of my head upon my bed, and behold, a watcher and an holy one came down from heaven. He cried aloud and said thus, Hew down the tree, and cut off his branches, shake off his leaves, and scatter his fruit. Let the beast get away from under it, and the fowls from his branches. Nevertheless, leave the stump of his roots in the earth, even with a band of iron and brass, and the tender grass of the field, and let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let his portion be with the beast in the grass of the earth. So in the Bible, Nebuchadnezzar is retelling his dream and a watcher, or an angel, came and cut down the tree, or at least wanted to, to leave the stump in the earth. Now interestingly, in the book of Enoch, one of the many scriptures not included in the Bible, has something very interesting to say about giant trees. Chapter 66, verse 2 through 3. Now then shall the angels labor at the trees, but when they proceed to do this, I will put my hand upon it and preserve it. So the angels are striving at the trees, and God wants to continue to preserve it, maybe through some event that petrified the stump immediately, keeping the roots intact. The seed of life shall arise from it, and a change shall take place, that the dry land may not be left empty. I will establish thy seed before me forever and ever, and thy seed of those who dwell with thee on the surface of the earth. It shall be blessed and multiplied in the presence of the earth, in the name of the Lord. It's the seed of these giant trees that give life to the barren lands, the connection with all things. Chapter 82, A Vision, verse 5 through 6. And falling to the earth, I saw likewise the earth absorbed by a great abyss, and mountains suspended over mountains. Hills were sinking upon hills. Lofty trees were gliding off from their trunks, and were in the act of being projected and of sinking into the abyss. 
If we combine both verses, we start to realize that the angels, who were after the trees, had something to do with the sinking of these great trees, or as it says, gliding off their trunks. They were projected, and landed into the abyss or hell, or even the waters. The word Nephilim is now being portrayed by History Channel as meaning aliens. I want to make it very clear that the way that they're presenting it is complete BS. Aliens are metaphysical, not terrestrial beings from other rocks in the sky. If anything, they may be other physical beings from inside of our earth, but that can be for another video. Sitchin assumed the word Nephilim comes from the Hebrew word Nephal, which usually means to fall, to come down, creating the translation, to come down from above. The form Nephilim can't mean fallen ones, the spelling would be Nephulim. Likewise, Nephilim does not mean those who fall, those who fall away. That would be Nophilim. The only way in Hebrew to get Nephilim from Nephal by the rules of Hebrew morphology, word formation, would be to presume a noun spelled Nephil and then pluralize it. I say presume since this noun does not exist in Biblical Hebrew. In Aramaic, the noun Nephil does exist. It means giant making it easy to see why the Septuagint, the ancient Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, translated Nephilim as gigantus, giant. Sitchin wants to argue the term Nephilim means those who came down from heaven so he can make the Nephilim sound like ancient astronauts. Not to mention he low-key was working for the CIA. So there were giants in the past. If you haven't seen my other video on giants, check it out as there's a lot to cover and I can't really fit it all into this video. Also, it gets into cosmology and our origins. Yes, we have the Titans, the great giants that had to do with the creation of our realm. The Archons, if you want to get metaphysical. But there's also the concept that we humans were larger in the past as well, and have slowly become smaller in size. H.P. Blavatsky goes over this. She says the first root race were androgynous blue beings that were called the Polarians. The human body in this age was much larger, and it makes so much sense now. The movie Avatar is real. Where are those blue beings? That's the best way we can imagine it right now. Although, like I said, that these pillars could be beyond trees as they're connecting this plane of reality to other planes or dimensions. These trees could also be energy devices for the Earth. Are the crystal caves the remnants of these ancient root systems? This is because crystals form under these antennae that are charged with immense energy. This is where all the gems of the world come from. Caves that go within the roots of these ancient trees. It makes sense now why crystals have a metaphysical nature. Everything is connected. The largest tree in the world is called Hyperion. Interestingly enough, and underneath, of course, there's a crystal cave. Now maybe when we look, we can see with different eyes. And who knows, maybe we can now make new discoveries that lead us to a new understanding of the world. How do you think the mesas of the world were formed? Is it aliens? How about the Nephilim, giants, or the fallen ones? Or is it giant trees let go of everything you think to be true relax the mind and ask the question do i truly understand what this reality is